Good morning. If you would begin by bowing with me, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our God and our Heavenly Father, you are a great and awesome God. And Lord, I tell you what, it should be easy for your people to sing how great is our God. Because Lord, if we are yours, if we're saved, if we're in the blood of the Lamb, we have every reason to sing that song to the top of our lungs. And I just praise you today for an opportunity to worship you. Lord, the Bible says that we will forever worship you, that we will forever be in your presence, and we will forever proclaim your praises. And Lord, I thank you for that. The psalmist said, one thing I ask of you, Lord, let me forever gaze upon your beauty. And Lord, I just pray today, Lord, that we gaze upon your beauty and the beauty of your word. And Lord, today is a very convicting message. It is for me. And I just pray, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross and the truth would be displayed in love. And, and Lord, I ask you to help me remember what I studied and not to leave anything out that needs to be said and to say nothing that needs to be left out, Lord. And just to ask you to glorify yourself today, God. You're a great and awesome God who can use anybody that's willing to be used. And I'm willing to be used and have little to offer, Lord. So I'm asking you to do what you want. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to move around here. For some reason or another, I like it better. All right. I told them this morning, and I want to tell you, last night I was talking to Ricky real late last night. He doesn't feel very well, and he's not here today. And he, But he always calls and says, what do you need? What do you need me to do? You want me to look up some just... just he, he's like a dog, just point what you don't even do, he's on it, you know what I mean, throw a stick and he'll get it. And he, uh, I said, I want to tell you something. I feel as insufficient to preach the message I got to preach tomorrow as I have ever felt before. I feel so humiliated to stand in front of a bunch of people and talk about something that I am so far away from perfecting. And of course, he says, but that's what makes you the one to preach it, because if you felt like you had it, you'd probably fail, which is true. Humility is something that God wants us to have. But the reality is, and I wanted to share this with you, is there are some messages that are easy for me to listen to. I told him this morning, you know, the Bible says not to covet your neighbor's donkey. And Chubby was here this morning, Chubby, my neighbor, and he got a feel full of donkey. And I've seen them over by the fence a lot of times and never have I wanted one. <laughs> and so whenever, whenever somebody preaches on not covering your neighbor's donkey, I feel real good about myself because my neighbor got donkeys and I don't want them, you know. But there's other parts of the Scripture that when, they, when it's preached and proclaimed, I want to get under the pew in front of me, you know what I mean? I just feel so humiliated exposed to the truth but at the same time i have never read the gospel in its entirety to read the th to read it in its face value and be left condemned because jesus is always the way out he's always the answer the only condemnation is for those who deny christ as their lord and so even though it's convicting it's also encouraging but last week Paul was encouraged as we began in chapter 5 last week, and I said, and I'm saying again, I wish that I was the kind of speaker that could just talk about chapter 5 all in one message because that's the way it needs to be done, but I can't, and so we're going to have to break it up in little bitty increments. And last week he says, at the beginning of chapter 5, I, I, he says, I want you as dearly loved children to be imitators of God and live a life of love. And most time we stop reading right there and we say, yeah, I love everybody. But he goes on to expound on that and he says, live a life of love just as Christ loved you and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, I understand that when Christ was on the cross and died for a bunch of sinners like us, that it was the greatest love ever demonstrated on this earth. Do you agree with that? But the greatest love that was ever demonstrated really was not Christ for me, but Christ for his father. You see, he loved his father so much that it poured over into his love for me. 
He was so devout to his father, so sold out to the will of his father, that he gave his life for me as a sacrifice, an offering to God. In the garden, he said, Father, glorify yourself. Now's the time. Glorify yourself to me. I don't want to do this, but if it's your will, do it. You understand? And, and, and so in my life, if I want to live a life of love, what I have to do is to begin to submit myself. Follow me now. The more I submit myself to God, the more it pours over into the relationships around me. The more I totally submit myself to God, the more it pours over in my marriage. The more it pours over with my children, the more it pours over with my church family, with my friends, with my neighbors, with the people. I have no clue who they are, but I just met them. The more I devout myself to God vertically this way, this is a vertical relationship. The more I get devout this way, the more it pours over in my horizontal relationships with other people. But, and, and this is how we know that's what he's talking about because he said, because I'm telling you, you can't even have a hint of immorality, which means there, now you say, oh man, I'm, I'm toast. If you ain't allowed to have a hint of immorality, you might as well just knock me in the head with something right now. What he's talking about is not a stench, not a hint of welcomed immorality in your life. Now, we're all sinners, okay? But we can't have sin in our life that we are welcoming and comfortable with it. He said you got to remove impurity from your life. If you really want to live a life of devotion to God, you have to get rid of every form of impurity. I don't know about you, but that convicts me. Whoo, it starts to convict me. And, and so if you would, I want to begin reading in, in verse 6, even though we already read this last week. And I'm going to read you from 6 to 14. And he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things the wrath of God comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them, for you who were want for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Man, I, I love this passage of Scripture right here. Because... We are all sinners, right? Everybody agree with that? We're all sinners. But what we love to do is categorize sin. We like to do it. If you don't know you do that yet, you do it. All right? I'm going to go on ahead. Because we got the, right over here in this column, we got the really, really bad ones. You know? In the really, really bad column, you got things like murder, rape. We got our, because I ask people sometimes, if you die right now, where are you going to go? They say, I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Because I've never murdered anybody. See, so they've justified that they're not in the really bad sin column. They're going to be all right. And then right here in the middle, we got the pretty bad sin column. We got things like addiction, social sex, homosexuality, things of that nature. We've got them in the pretty bad sin column. They're not out here hurting people like murderers, but it's pretty bad. And then over here, we got the, oh, it really don't matter because everybody does it, sin column. We got the white lies and the gossip and the slander and the hate and the things like that that everybody's really got its baggage, and so we really don't pay it that much attention. But the reality is, do you know that the Bible says that no gossip will enter the kingdom of heaven? Now, let me 
ask you something. Why would God pick out such a little bitty, don't really even matter because everybody does it, sin and say that no gossip will go to heaven? That's right. It, it, it's still disobedience. The reality is it does hurt others. But it is disobedience. Why did Satan get kicked out of heaven? Disobedience. Why did Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden? Disobedience. And why are we separated from God? Disobedience. It's all disobedience. If God says do it and you don't do it, it's disobedience, which is a direct defiance of the authority of God. And Paul says, as now that we have become children of light, we can't be, he says, partners with them anymore. And if you have the King James with you, it does a better job of translating that verse. It says partakers. Don't be partakers with them. The best way to translate it is to be a co-participant. I, I want you to put that word in your mind because we're going to talk about it a little more. I want you to roll it around like flyer, a chicken in flour. You know what I mean? Get it all over you. Co-participant. Do not be a co-participant with them. See, the reality is, is I am never going to win the world if I still am the world. I cannot be a co-participant with them. He, he says, now I love this part right here. Don't let anybody deceive you with empty words. Because it is disobedience that the wrath of God is coming. So I tell you, brothers, don't be co-participants with the world in sin. It ain't just murder that the wrath of God is coming. It's disobedience. Now, if you're in this room and you're saved, you're saved because there was a day that you were convicted of your sin. All right? Now, if you have never been convicted of your sin, then you're not saved. And if you've got questions about that, I'd love to talk with you. We'll sit down and talk about it. But if you have never been convicted of sin, you're not saved. Because the Holy Spirit must convict you of your sin, and you must repent of that sin in order to be saved. That is Scripture. Scripture. And so here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're 8 or 18 or 80. It doesn't matter. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin you realize that you have lived for something other than God. What you've lived for is for you. You realize that? That sin is glorifying you and your flesh rather than God. Your mama tells you not to do something, and you do it. As a child, it really don't even matter. She tells you not to write on the wall, don't eat in the bed, don't put your shoes on the table, and you do it. Why? She told you not to. Why do you do it? Because you are a spirit of disobedience. You have a sin root. And when God tells us not to do things, we just can't hardly help ourselves. We are a fleshly led people. And if we follow our own feelings rather than the truth, we will be walking in the way of sin. Every time we will be participating in the rebellion of the world. Anybody got some kids that's starting to display a sense of rebellion? We don't like to talk about it. I'll well, tell you something. That's the reason why the world's headed to hell. It's because the church got tired of talking about it. Swept it under the rug and started making things pretty. I'm raising a bunch of sinners. I see the spirit of rebellion in them. It scares me to death. I pray for them every day. Because I know they're sinners and I know that they have a fleshly desire to do the things that God said not to do. I know that. And so the, th this is what Paul said. He's, listen, I like this part. You got to listen to this because sometimes we don't get it. When we read it, we read right over. He says, you were once darkness. Now, most time when I read that, I hear you were once in darkness. But that's not what he said. He didn't say you were once in darkness. He said you once were darkness. Let me give you a good example of that. Most people, when their kids do something stupid, they say little Johnny got with the wrong crowd. Truth is, little Johnny is the wrong dying crowd. Oh, not my baby. Yes, your baby. And my baby too. My baby too, because you were once darkness. You know what the word darkness is defined as? 
the absence of light. Let me tell you something. Romans chapter 6 says, When you were a slave to sin, you were free from righteousness. When you were a slave to sin, you governed your life based upon what you thought was right rather than on what God says is right. So I, 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 this is going to take participation. Now, the first crew done this pretty good. I'm expecting just as much from you. All right? How many people believe, reason in your mind, that when you were as lost as you ever was, you were still a person of morals? And every one of you are right. I had some morals when I was as lost as I ever was. I told them this morning, I have never really been a liar. I hate lies. I stink at it. I mean, I used to come in the house and I'd get busted and I'd try to come up with some kind of good lie to tell my mama, but I am so dumb at lying that she would know I was lying before I even got the whole sentence out. You know what I mean? Because I stink at it. And then if you lie to somebody, you got to remember what you told them. And I can't remember Jack, so I'm not good at lying. I hate lies. And even when I was as screwed up in sin as I ever was in my life, I never was really bad at telling lies because it does not go, it's no good for me. Okay? And so I could consider myself at that time a moral guy. Hey, I don't tell lies much. But then I lived lies. Because I appeared as something I was not. You see, when I was at church, I could be a churchy guy. And when I was with the world, I could be as worldly as you wanted to be. But I still, in some ways, had morals. You know what I mean? But I was darkness because God did not have control of my life. Now, follow me here. I lived my life based on what I thought was right. You follow me? At the time I was lost, I lived my life based on what I thought was right. There were some sins that was a million miles from me because I didn't think it was right. Me and my wife, we had a child totally unplanned, both her in high school, me just out. Not planned at all. I can honestly, I never will forget the day we went to the health department. Never, ever will I ever forget it. We went up there for the first time. Nobody in the world knows but me and her. Miss Becky Horn, she hooked her up to the thing, and we could hear that boom, 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 boom. Heartbeat for the first time. And in one part of me, I was scared to death. Had no clue what I was going to do. But I wouldn't have took nothing. For that, doom, doom, doom. no way was I going to destroy that thing. You know what I mean? I couldn't even knock a kitten in the head, and I don't like cats. I mean, that, that, there ain't no way. I, I wasn't going to do that. There wasn't no way. You know what I mean? I, I, and so for me, I've always considered that immoral because I know that's not God's will. But, but does that make me righteous? No, because there were so many things I knew were wrong in God's eyes that I was doing anyway. I had a kid out of wedlock. I could sit up here and say, look at me, I'm righteous. No, I wasn't righteous. You see, the fruit of righteousness is goodness and righteousness and truth. I, I read it to you. He defines, he defines what light is. And, and guess what? There's the problem the church has is defining what's good and right and true. But they shouldn't. Because in order to get something right, you have to have a scale in which to measure it by. Do you realize that? A anybody ever been around them calibrating something like a set of scales? And when you calibrate a set of scales, you have to have a weight to sit on there that you know exactly what it weighs. You understand? If you're going to calibrate a set of scales, you have to say, say you got a 50-pound weight. And when you set that 50-pound weight on there, it's got to weigh 50 pounds. And when it weighs 50 pounds, then you can get that scale right. But you can't put Billy Bob on there and say, how much you weigh, Billy Bob? 200. 
Really, he's closer to 235, but he feels better about himself telling you 200, all right? And so you calibrate the scales to Billy Bob, and you got it all messed up. Because what he told you wasn't true, but it makes him feel better to believe it. We live in a world who has tried to calibrate the truth based upon what somebody feels better as, and that's garbage. You have to weigh it in a true balance. The, follow me. The, the scale in which you're going to be weighed in is right there. When Belshazzar seen the writing on the wall, what did Daniel say? You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Folks, that right there was the balance. God's truth. If this don't say it's good, it ain't good. And if this don't say it's righteous, it ain't righteous. And if this right here don't say it's true, that it ain't true. You understand it? And so when we start governing the church, we have to use this as the scale by which the church is weighed by. And when we start governing our lives, this has to be the scale in which everything is weighed by. It has to be. And when that happens, when that happens, then we can, then we will know what pleases God. I love that he added in there and find out what pleases God. How in the world are you supposed to calibrate your life according to the truth if you have no idea what God's truth is? We got a world full of people out there shooting at the mark of God and have no idea where to aim because the truth is oblivious to them. They have no clue what God's truth is. They got their theology from a song. I mean, I hear it all the time. Grandma's going to go to heaven and be an angel. No, she's not. She'd be getting demoted. Grandma is above the angels if she's saved. If she ain't, she ain't going to heaven. And that's the truth. But we get our theology from songs, and it becomes the way we interpret everything. But it ain't true. This is true. And when, when I start weighing everything in this balance, when I find out what pleases God, all right, when I get verse 10 down, when I begin to find out what pleases God, then listen to verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, I want to tell you something. Right there in verse 11, Catlett said last night, and I'm on t he said, man, when you get to verse 11, you're going to have to be careful how you say it. And I said, I know, and I want you to be praying. And he said, I'll be praying while you're preaching, I promise. Because verse 11 is where a lot of people, they mess it all up. They miss the boat. They totally missed the boat. Folks, I believe that verse 11 is destroying churches everywhere. I think it's a failure in many churches, even this one. In verse 11, he says, have nothing to do with the fruitful, fruitless deeds of darkness. Don't be a co-participant with the deeds of darkness. Don't get with the world in darkness. Now, I told him in an early service, does anybody... I'm answering your question. I already know the answer to After you've been in the dark a while, does your eyes adjust to the dark? Well, of course they do. I told them. Now, this is my, my lovely wife sitting right here on the front row. And this is sometimes a heated discussion in our house. We go to bed relatively the same time at all time. And sometimes she get a little tired of waiting on me because John Wayne ain't hardly got the dust settled yet. And I'll be there in just a few minutes. You know? And, uh, and, and she'll get aggravated and turn the light off before I get there. Now, that is a hostile conversation in our house because we are people of clutter. Maybe your house ain't that way. And, 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 and I pretty much know where everything is, but when, it, when I first walk out of the hallway and into the dark bedroom, I can't see squat. You know what I mean? And, and so I'm over going, oh, my God, holding on to my toe. I just tore the end of it off on the chest of drawers saying, woman, I told you about turning the dang light out before I got in the bed. I can't see nothing. Just come out of the light right in the dark, and it's obvious. My gosh, it's dark in here. But my bladder awakens me two or three times a night. 
uh, with sort of a kind of an emergency. We got to go, you know what I mean? And, and the thing about it is, is it's just as dark in the room. It's got, it isn't any darker. But when I get up in the middle of the night after I've been in there, man, I can walk right straight there and I can pretty much see everything. Let me put this in perspective. You got saved. Your friends didn't. They don't even realize how dark it is. You see, you've been exposed to the light, man. And when you see the truth of the gospel message of Jesus Christ and you turn around and look at the world, you say, man, this is a mess. I mean, when I look at the gospel, when I read the truth of God's word and I start looking at the lives that make up our world, I say, man, we got a mess. But the world don't realize how big a mess it is because they done got used to walking in the dark. They're walking in the dark, man. They don't even realize it, all right? And so you supposedly got saved. Man, I remember when I got saved, I was the laughing stock amongst my friends because you have to understand, there was nothing that they done I hadn't done. You know what I mean? I had acted like a complete fool among these people. I talked like the world. I lived like the world. I desired like the world. When I got saved, they was all laughing. Ah, ha, ha. Yeah. I had a little w, WJD bracelet. I remember the kids gave it to me at church when I got saved. They rode me like a borrowed pony over that thing. Goodness sake. All of them was good old boys. And they all believed in God. But it was weird now that I was convicted about the things we used to do. Old Bible thumper, you know. Now, what would have happened is if I'd have just went on ahead and kept doing the things I used to do? Because there's a major problem with the world. We got two sides here. One of them, one side is we want to be a co-participant with the world. And I want to tell you something. It don't make no difference what you say. If you're as drunk as the world, if you have the relationships with the world, if you desire the same things as the world, if you talk like the world and laugh at the world jokes and tell the world jokes, then to the world you're still the world. And that's just the way it is. How, and some people get all jacked up when you tell them have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, man. They'll hump up like a cat on you. And they'll say, wait a minute, dude. We got to be out there telling them about Jesus. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. We're going to be out there telling them about Jesus. And I say, you're right. You're right. But how in the world do you lead a drunk man to the Lord when you're as drunk as he is? Bible says it's the blind leading the blind. How in the world do you lead a bunch of gossips to the Lord when you're the one that started the juicy conversation? How in the world is somebody ever going to be convicted about their language when you're telling off color jokes? You see what I mean? And so if I am the world, I'm never going to reach the world. The greatest thing, and I, and I challenge you to prove me wrong on this, the greatest thing you can do for your lost friends is not participate in their sin. Get away from their sin. You say, man, but I love my friends. I know you do. And if you love them, you show them what a changed life looks like. And I guarantee you, this is old Derek's guarantee, when it all falls apart, when the chips is down, when their wife leaves them and her kids are broken or something goes wrong, they ain't going to go down there on Friday night to everybody else at the hell raising competition and talk to them. They'll be coming and finding you. I know I done been there. They'll never bite you to the bring your own beer barbecue. But when it gets time to talk about the truth, they'll find you. I told them this morning, my wife, she'll know exactly what I'm talking about. We, 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 we've been to weddings all over the world. And everybody knows weddings get a little bit out of hand sometimes. And, and I mean, I mean, I've been to them when they was drunk when we got started. And which one are you marrying? You know, I, I ain't promoting it, but I wasn't there to throw no rocks at them because of how in the world am I going to witness them saying, I tell you what, I can't be no part of this. I'm going to the truck. It was a mess. But, but sometimes it's obvious that we are hindering what they want to do. And, and I never will forget this one night. Becky's already grinning. Everything was, I thought we was part of the cool crowd that night. I really did. I thought we was part of the cool crowd. We was laughing and cutting up and everybody was having a good time. And man, I thought for once we're cool. And, and then finally, this one said, 
about time for y'all to go, I guess. And I, <laughs> it was the most unsmooth transition in a conversation I've ever seen in my life. And I said, Lord have mercy. Look at the time. You're right. And when we got to the car, me and Becky was both dying laughing and said, we, uh, I believe that that is the biggest y'all need to leave I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> you know? And the thing about it is, is I guess they thought that we were going to thank whatever they thought we was going to thank. And that doesn't bother me at all. Because here's the thing. If they want to act like a fool, I'm not going to act like a fool with them. I don't, I mean, they, they can stand on their head, they can do whatever they want to, but I'm not going to act like a fool because I serve a different God now. I don't need to think, I don't need them to think I'm cool. I don't need them to think I'm the man. I don't need them to think I'm anything. I don't care. I'm not going to be a participant, but by the same time, I'm not going to be a Pharisee. You know what a Pharisee does, don't you? They show up at every social discussion with a handful of rocks. Them's the rock throwingest people I ever heard of in my life. They're just waiting to chuck one at somebody. And Jesus called them all sons of Satan. And sometimes that's the way the world is. Man, we'll pitch a rock at somebody's sin, but we can't own our own. And I refuse to be a partaker, but I ain't going to be no Pharisee neither. As a matter of fact, in order to expose people to the light, there's one thing you got to do, and you got to be the light. You understand, I'm not a source of light. Jesus is the source of light. I'm in Jesus. I am literally a lampstand. All I do is hold the light. I am the light of the world, but he's the source of light. I'm just holding up the light. I have to be the light. And the light says this. It don't have to be this way. You want to reach your friends? Let me tell you something. I, I've learned this. Some people have been with me in situations like this. You can talk all you want to to a drunk. You ain't getting very far. And you, know, you don't have no idea how many nights a wife has called me, sisters called me, a mama's called me, said, I need you to come here. And I've went over and I've sit and I've talked and I've prayed and I've been there half the night, sometimes most of the night. I never really felt like I got anywhere. Man, I've seen some of the awfulest things you've ever seen. I've seen a fellow one night get up in the living room when he got stopped. His head, he was still in the living room and his head was in the kitchen, run his head completely through the wall. It's real hard to tell a man about Jesus when he is so crossed up that he cannot stand up off the couch without running his head through the wall. But you know what? I wasn't there to throw no rocks. I loved him. And I still, I mean, I loved him. I was just there to talk to him. But the reality is, if you want to share faith with your friends, going down there Friday night when they're so crossed up, they don't know where they are, is probably not the best time. Stop going to the hell-raising hangout Stop by Tuesday afternoon on the way home from work when you see him out mowing his yard. Right? Because it's then that he ain't with it. You ever notice that it's real hard to talk to somebody about salvation and a big crew of people? So pray for God to open doors for opportunities. If you really want to reach them, don't use reaching them as an excuse to participate in their sin because that's what a lot of people's doing. They say, oh, I'm just trying to reach my friends. If you want to reach them, turn the light on. Don't be as dark as they are because you ain't reaching nobody that way. Ask God to open a door opportunity and give you a chance to get them off by themselves and tell them, hey, it don't got to be this way no more. You can tell the person who can't make it through a day without a drink, it don't got to be this way. You can tell the old boy that can't make it through an hour without a pill or snorting a lie, it don't got to be this way no more. You can tell the person who has ruined their family with sexual sin. You can tell the girl who has no confidence in herself and is trying to prove how worthy she is in immoral ways. You can tell the old boy who's had no confidence in himself and got himself so far into a pornography addiction, he don't know what's right or wrong anymore. You can look at every one of them in the eyes. You can look in the eyes of people who have this humiliated their family and they're sick of themselves and tell them, Hey, it don't got to be this way no more, man. Jesus Christ died to break the chains of sin. He done it for me. He can do it for you. It don't got to be this way. You know what they call the gospel? Good news. 
That is one of my favorite expressions of the gospel. Are you telling everybody like it's good news? Because I want to tell you something. I have been so broken that I laid on the floor and cried to the carpet. was wet saying, God, I don't want to be this way no more, but I don't know how to quit. And I want to tell you something. The gospel is the best news I ever heard. And I need to look for opportunities to share the light with those who's walking in the dark. That's what it means to live as a child of light. Listen to what he says. Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know who he's talking to right there? This whole letter is addressed to the church. He ain't talking to the world. You know, the people that's asleep is the church. Man, we're taking a big spiritual nap. The world is passing us by and we're staring at the back of our eyelids. He said, wake up, man, wake up. We're losing ground here. We're not being the light of the world. The world's getting darker because we have put the light under a bowl. And this part right here may be my favorite part. Rise from the dead. You know, when Lazarus come out, there was something different about Lazarus coming out of the grave than Jesus coming out of the grave one, Jesus walked out by his own power, and Lazarus walked out by Jesus' power. But one of the cool things about it is Jesus left his grave clothes in the tomb, and Lazarus come out bound. Can you see this? I mean, he's bound like a mummy. You can just see him hopping out like a rabbit, and he says, loosen the grave clothes. Let me ask you something. I mean, you can just see everybody out there cry, laugh. They didn't think I'd ever see you again laying one on him. I'm, you know, Lazarus was the dude right there. Everybody's snotting on him and slobbering on him. And when all that was over, what do you think Lazarus did? Well, I see y'all. I'm going to go back in here and take me a little lap on this rock. Back here in this tomb. How foolish would it be for a man who just got raised from the dead to go back in his tomb and lay down on that stupid rock? Folks, if I've been raised from the dead of sin, why in the world am I still laying in the tomb of sin? I'm going to tell you what Lazarus did. He spent the rest of the day hanging out with Jesus. That's what Lazarus did. He spent the rest of the day out Jesus' crowd. And I want to tell you one more story, and we're going to close with this right here because this story right here gives me the heebie-jeebie goosebumps. Jesus' first public miracle. Anybody know what it was? Turning the water into wine. Let me ask you something. Now, this right here is going to require some thinking. How many people got touched by that miracle? Only those in his circle. Mary knew, and the disciples knew, and nobody else knew. Nobody. This is what happened. Jesus, you realize that Jesus was at one of them wedding parties when people lose their control of themselves and drank too much. Do you realize that's where he's at? Some people say, oh, not my Jesus. No, no. He turned the water into grape juice. Well, read the story. The banquet master said, they wait till most of the time they bring out the good wine and wait till everybody gets plum crossed up and then they bring out the cheap stuff. You have brought out the best. You understand, at this point, everybody is feeling pretty good about it. They're dancing with the wrong women. You know what I mean? They, they don't even know who they come with, and they ain't real sure where they was sitting, and they don't have a clue where they parked the camel, and they don't know how they're getting home. Those people were there. Yes, they were there. Jesus was at a situation like that. You're saying it's true. Yes, I'm saying it's true. I'm saying he was there, but he was not a participant of it. As a matter of fact, Jesus was a total outcast in that crowd because he wasn't in with them, but he was there. He loved them. As a matter of fact, his mother come over and said, they've run out of wine. And he said, woman, why do you involve me? You ever told your mom that? Mom, why do you get me into this stuff? Gosh, why do you involve me? But this is my favorite part. This right here, this part right here is my favorite part. It's one of my favorite things in the scripture. Now, you understand, these boys had never seen Jesus do no miracle. These 12 inner disciples, they ain't never seen nothing like this. Mary knows who he is. She has been an angelic appearance. She knows that he is Emmanuel. She knows that this is El Shaddai. 
And she looks at the disciples with one of my favorite statements in the Bible and says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And I want to tell you something. Every time I read that, it puts goosebumps all over me. Because the only people that left changed was the people who done what he asked them to do. The rest of the people, they left as crossed up and lost as they was when they got there. Ain't that something? They were right there in a room where miracles took place and didn't even know it. And I want to tell you something, folks. There's people in this room today. There's people in church rooms everywhere that will be in the mix of life-changing miracles, and they won't even know it. Because the only people that's going to get changed in this room is the ones who do what he tells them to do. If you're here today and he has convicted you that you are absolutely lost, the only way you're ever going to get saved is to follow the conviction of the Holy Spirit and submit and repent and do what he asks you to do. If you're here today and you are saved but you are off in la-la land somewhere, you're spiritually asleep and went back in the tomb to take yourself a little nap, the only way you're ever going to get back where he wants you to be is repent and submit and lay it at the foot of the cross one more time and do what he asks you to do. If you're here today and you've got somebody that you know is lost and God's been laying it on your heart to go talk to them, the only way you're ever going to ever experience a miracle, guess what it's going to be? You're going to have to do what he's asking you to do. You want to change in your marriage? Do what he's asking you to do. You want to change in your way you function with your kids? Do what he's asking you to do. You want to see revival in the church? Do what he's asking you to do. You want to see America come back to where it used to be? Then all we got to do is what he asks us to do. And it'll work. But until we do what we ask us to do. What if he'd have told Peter, take some out of that jar and take it to the master, the banquet. And Peter said, I ain't doing that. That's just water. That would have really screwed up the story. But you understand, you got to do what he's asking you to do because you will change the end of your story with your disobedience won't you come as we sing our invitation hymn